welcome to tonight's webinar. Um, we really appreciate your time in the evening, especially when the pubs are open. We know that's also um, in competition for your time at the moment. I think we'll go around and do some introductions um, very quickly. My name is Steph. I'm the CSP student coordinator. I'm just going to be in the background um, helping with anything technical. Uh, uh, evening, everybody. My name is Ewan McComiskey, uh, physio by background, but the professional advisor for digital data and Northern Ireland at the CSP. I'll pass over to Pippa. Hi everyone, I'm Pippa McCabe. I am a physiotherapist. I work in the Southeastern Trust um, in the lymphedema service in Northern Ireland. Um, and I'm also on secondment at the moment as an AHPE health professional advisor in the public health agency here. Hi there, I'm Becky. I'm a um, second year physio student at the University of Winchester. Um, and I'm here to talk about my experience on a virtual placement. Um, it's great to speak to you all tonight. Um, and thanks for giving up, giving up your evenings as well. Um, we want to really talk a, about digital physio and, you know, is virtual the new reality? So Pip, I'll give some, um, some real life, some, some de um, data from a survey that, that she ran across Northern Ireland. Becky, I'll give you some real life experience of, of uh, virtual consultations uh, as part of our um, student placements. But I just wanted to give you a wee bit of a, an overview of how we got to this point in time. So 2020 was, was a year like no other. Um, from the Australian bushfires to the explosion in Beirut, the violence that led to and followed the peaceful Black Lives Matter protests, uh, the violent protests in Hong Kong, impeachment, or at least the first one of um, former President Trump, and of course, Brexit. But of course, the big news in 2020 pales into sig insignificance when we think about the damage that COVID had on everybody's lives. If we take one good thing out of the awful thing that was COVID, it has to be the spark that leads to the revolution, the digital revolution that healthcare has needed for years or even has needed for decades. Like Charles Darwin said, those who collaborate and improvise will prevail. And we need physiotherapists and student physiotherapists particularly to be among those to lead that digital innovation in healthcare, both in the acute response to COVID that you are all part of, the rehabilitation following COVID that you are all going to be part of in, in placements, and vitally the recovery and regeneration of all the other services that COVID indirectly affected. And those services that, again, you, you may have been part of in, in student placements and definitely will be in, in years to come. What I want to do now is just ask if Steph can run the first poll for us. So do you think the physiotherapy profession makes optimal use of technology? So yes, we're at the top of the game, kind of. We do some good stuff, but room for improvement. Not sure there are loads of opportunities, but we don't take them yet. And no way, we're only scratching at the surface. But there we go. So we're both, oh, majority of us in the middle of the road there. So, you know, 42% saying doing some good stuff, but room for improvement. A few saying there's loads of opportunities that we're not quite at the taking just yet. And then there's a few saying we're only scratching at the surface. If I sat on the fence, I would be happy with options two, three or four. I definitely don't think we're at the top of the game yet, but I want you to help us get to that point. So I'd put myself somewhere in the middle of the road there as well. What, what did the CSP do in response to COVID when it hit us? And it said we're, we're a, a year and a bit over the first lockdown now and I was in London when we were locked down it was a very surreal experience walking out of CSP HQ that night uh, and seeing everybody walking home with computers under their arms to go and work from home uh, but that was the start of um, the, the CSP's response to COVID. So what did we do? Well we just like all our members had to launch into these digital solutions at a pace and at a scale that we've never ever seen before. Our membership had to launch into to delivering services that had been face-to-face -face for as long as we can remember to virtual almost overnight in places. And that was a quite a scary thing. There was a, a, a big but not complete cultural shift towards the acceptance of digital. So it was digital by necessity rather than by choice. And we'll pick that up a wee bit later on. So people were being forced into digital. So it was, you know, um, physical by no, with no choice pre-COVID, it was digital uh, with no choice uh, into the COVID world. And what we used to see as barriers 
um, to implementation quickly just became challenges and they just appeared somewhere on a risk register rather than being the excuses or the reasons we, that things didn't even get off the ground at all. What has also really become clear is the importance of evaluation of sharing of the data that we're able to find. And again, I look forward to hearing some more stuff from Pippa around about that. Because before COVID, we didn't have solutions that were impl implemented at pace because we'd never seen anything like COVID. So why would we? The evidence and the evaluation data that we had was much more around about how um, passionate, enthusiastic clinicians were using um, platforms and devices uh, with enthusiastic patients so overwhelmingly positive responses to that um, but what is it like for all clinicians and for all patients so we, it's important that we get that, uh, that that data coming in what we did see at the start of covid was you know some really helpful um, clarification on information governance which came out of nhs x so although they are an english organization it, it you know it was a uk-wide agreement right across the the um, the, the four nations and that was really helpful what they said there was that we could use platforms that we wouldn't have used ideally if there was no practical alternative so things like zoom facetime you know messaging whatsapp if there was no practical alternative and it was as safe as we could possibly make it those things were back on the table again having not been on the table before now while we would necessarily want to lean on them long term we certainly can think about how we can use those safely and effectively in that long term. So when we go back, back to it's not back to normal, it's back to better in the use of some of those um, those platforms. And those of you who've either worked in the NHS or who've been in placement in the NHS will be familiar with the old saying that crisis breeds innovation or never, never waste a good crisis. Because we're all forced into things, we open our eyes, we open our heads into thinking about what we could do to address the situation that we're facing. And we need to make the most of that, that, that innovation space that we find ourselves in. So... The, the, the link on the, in the middle of the page here will take you to some of the case studies that some of our members have put together about what platforms they're using to be able to, to meet the challenges they're facing with their different patient groups and their different settings in their different parts of the UK. There's some awesome stuff on there, over 20 case studies. Please go check them out. Um, we've got guidance on how to implement remote solutions at pace and at scale, um, you know, at a an acute response, but also over a longer time with development and improvement cycle uh, information in there as well. We, we're sharing examples of some of the platforms our members are using in the case studies. We also have the CSP app library that we've just signed a year's uh, extension to, um, which gives all CSP members access to the ORCA platform, which allows us to, to recommend with confidence any apps that are going to help us. And you can search for the apps that suit you best and suit your patients best. Um, elsewhere uh, within physiotherapy but not just within the UK there's been a massive increase a response to the demand that was happening on the bottom left hand side here th those little pieces are parts of a ventilator now, they were 3D printed by a physiotherapist in the north of Italy so right back at the very start of 2020 when the pandemic, pandemic was having its biggest effect in, in, in the north of Italy they were running out and they couldn't keep up with, with the, the demands on the, the parts of the ventilators so a, th a physiotherapist 3D printed them and for every single one of those just in those picture think about another patient who's been given the chance at survival if we didn't have that 3d printing that's how many patients wouldn't have made it i know that's a bit sobering at this time of the evening but but that's the reality of the situation innovation saved lives in the north of italy the picture in the bottom right the chap on the left hand side there is a physiotherapist the chap on the right hand side um is a, a, a respiratory consultant the patient in the middle there has COVID. Um, and again, this is this is from the north of Italy, right back at the start of 2020. Um, and what the chap in the middle is wearing is a recommissioned scuba mask. So they ran out of non-invasive ventilators or ventilation uh, equipment. And the between the physiotherapist on the left and the respiratory consultant on the right, they came up with this idea to recommission these scuba masks into non-invasive ventilation. So you can see that at the top, they've got a bit of um, positive pressure going in there and they're able to use that to help to support the, the patient's breathing. So again, innovation at pace, using things that you probably wouldn't normally get away with in an ICU setting, but that chap in the middle has had another shot at life. So 
innovation in crisis can save lives and can mean the difference between the patient surviving, but also let's not be about the boost the clinicians getting through that as well, because imagine how difficult it was for them. So what does physiotherapy look like in 2021 compared to 2020, or even if we stretch our heads back to 2019? It's a heck of a lot different now than it used to be. It's absolute night and day what it used to be when I qualified in 2007. Um, just uh, last week, there was UK government guidance came out, which supported the use of a hybrid model of digital and physical or online and offline delivery of healthcare services. Now, the, the, the menu, the recipe of that hybrid model is going to be different depending on a whole load of different factors around about um, patient preference, around about conditions, about connectivity, about social demographics, about finance, about device availability, et cetera, et cetera. But hybrid Digital, digital and physical healthcare delivery is here to stay. Digital inclusion is absolutely critical, much more so than it was, you know, a, a couple of years back. When we rebuild and we reconstruct these services out the back of COVID, we cannot just simply keep providing services for those that were able to access our physical face-to-face -face services because people were excluded with it for those services as well. So we need to use digital as a way of including even more of our populations, our harder to reach populations, to make sure that physiotherapy services are available for everybody. But we don't need to make this a big singing, song and dance. What we're doing through digital is we're, we're adding to the toolkit that we've got as physiotherapists. What we're doing is finding a different way to use the same tools that we use in a physical face-to-face -face conversation to use them in a virtual conversation. Yes, we might need to tweak them and reshape them a little bit, but it's not a completely new set of skills. We're just improving the ones that we've got and it has to be part of a new normal for everybody. Um, current state of play for physiotherapy, informatics or for digital. Um, I'm proud to wear the, the geek badge. It's a badge I wear with pride. I, I understand digital. I love it. I bore everybody else about it. There are much more level ones than there were a couple of years ago. The level two, the enthusiasts understand the need for it, the support it, tolerate the geeks. And then there's the rest who don't get it. It's not my job and think that the geeks are geeks. We all know somebody who fits into those, every one of those categories, whether it's at work, at uni or, or in your family or with your friends. What I need to do at the CA P is get everybody at level three into base level two and level two bubble up those ones that want to be in level one uh, and I said support the ones that are in level one because it can be a, a, a lonely place at times. How are we going to do that? Through the, the, We set up the digital informatics physiotherapy group, the DIPG, back in February 2019, slightly fortuitous because we didn't know what was coming. We started off with 30 folk in a room at HQ in London uh, and we've now got over 400 people on an email list, nearly 3,000 on an ICSP channel. It's just bringing good like-minded folk together to share ideas, solutions, challenges, opportunities, failures as well. And it's a broad church and we welcome everybody in there. So we'd love to have more students. We don't have enough, uh, not enough for my liking, but we've got people there who are, are digital leads at government level. We've got, you know, band nines and everybody in between. And I'd love to have more students there to, to challenge our thinking around about things. Um, you can see there what we've been up to um, in the last two years. We've been pretty busy, not just um, gaining members, but delivering things for those members as well. So some of you have seen the digital physio series. It's now on the website, including uh, contributions from um, some from student members. Uh, there are three students who've got published um, articles on the CSP website as a result of that, um, and and a whole lot more stuff that's coming. So. These slides uh, will be shared with you and they'll be on the recording so you can pick up some of the stuff that we've got planned, but just to give you a snapshot of what we're up to. And if you want to join us, please do so. Email dipg at csp.org.uk. We'll get you involved. There's no time commitment, no financial com commitment. Um, all we want is for you to be a little bit interested and or involved in any, any aspect of digital data or technology as part of physiotherapy. And that's enough to get you in, get you started, and then just use the group use the group to learn and to and to drive our profession forward and you can follow everything on twitter as well i'm at emahp info and you can follow digital physio chat uh, hashtag digital physio physio as well i want and i need digital physio to be part of the new norm that we're moving into as i said we're going back to better not back to normal I don't think genuinely in my lifetime that technology will ever replace a physiotherapist. However, a digitally enabled and data aware and digitally literate physiotherapist will absolutely replace one who is not.
So we need to make sure that all of us, our colleagues, our classmates, our patients, are able to utilise technology as part of physiotherapy services. Doing this will result in better outcomes for our patients and innovation leading to their profession to, to new heights. I can't wait to be part of that um, digital physio journey with you all, uh, but are you ready for that? Uh, and for those that think that physio hands-on profession, I agree with you, but there are different ways that we can use the best tools that we've got as physios. Those are our hands, our eyes and our ears, and digital, digital can be part of that solution. Um, so I look forward to hearing more from Pippa and, and from Becky about their experiences of technology and physiotherapy through COVID. And I look forward to some questions and answers uh, at the end of that. Um, that's all from me. Okay, can everyone see that all right? Yep, yep, got a nod. Hang on, I just need to move this because I can't see my what I'm trying to see. There we go. Okay. Um, Thank you very much, um, Steph, for asking me along uh, this evening. Um, as I've said, I am a physio uh, and I'm not a particularly good one to talk about virtual consultation. However, because uh, the service that I manage, the most of what we do is compression bandaging and it's pretty hard to do that through a screen. Um, but I do know a lot of people that have embraced virtual consultation over the last few years um, and it's their experiences that I'm going to share with you today. Before I did that, I was going to ask you um, just to do a poll as well. And we thought we might try and do that through um, Mentimeter instead, just so that we could get a little word cloud. So if you have got the means to take a picture of that QR code, Oh, look at that, you've all done it already. Or as a patient. Good, so most people have had a bit of experience using video conferencing. And then the next question I wanted to ask you was, what do you like about it? What works well? Brilliant. And this is good, because it'll see how we compare things to the survey that we did across Northern Ireland. And they're always a really good Twitter picture, aren't they? So I'm gonna take one. Excellent, that marries across really well um, with what we're probably going to look at later. Fabulous, thank you. So we move on to the next one then, is what you don't like about it. What things is it not good for, um, particularly within physiotherapy? Are there any issues around using it? Brilliant, well done. There's lots coming in. Fabulous. Thank you. That's brilliant. So these are the things I'm going to cover today and um, just a quick look at how virtual consultation has been used in AHP services in Northern Ireland, a quick look at the results of a survey that we carried out at the start of the first wave and then some examples of innovation um, over here. So if you're not from Northern Ireland, this is a very colourful little map of how our health and social care trusts are laid out. So there's Belfast is that we purple blob in the middle and then the others are very imaginatively named um, as geographical regions so those are the five health and social care trusts in Northern Ireland and when we did our consultation and looked at this data we amalgamated all of the data from those five trusts and this graph here is just showing you the difference between uh, the four months March to June 2019 compared to March to June 2020 in the use of telephone and video for assessment and review of patients. Just need to point out that the, the axis there are different and um, there were a lot more phone than there were video but my graphs make them look quite similar and um, so you just point that out to you but it's obvious that um, we obviously didn't use a lot in 2019 and then when COVID hit there was a significant rise um, and interesting to note as well that the video rise continued to increase um, whereas telephone waxed and waned a little bit. And then this is just showing virtual consultations as a percentage of the overall consultations that happened. So you can see there um, in April 2020, telephone was nearly 60% of all our con consultations were carried out by phone. Um, and again, interesting to note that telephone reduces a little bit over the, the period of time, whereas video is gradually increasing. 
And I'm sorry that I don't have any data beyond that time. This was just when we were really looking at it because I would love to see how that's changed over the next wave. Um, and now as things are getting back to normal a little bit more um, with face to face, because I expect that those numbers will have reduced significantly, but I'm hoping not back to where they were completely um, as, as both staff and the public have really um, experienced the benefits of virtual consultation. So on to our results then. So at the start of the pandemic, we um, sent out a, a survey um, just to really try and get people's thoughts around virtual consultation. Um, we had 460 responses from across Northern Ireland, um, and this just breaks them down by trust and by profession. It's interesting here, I don't know if it's the same across the rest of the UK, but speech and language therapists in Northern Ireland were hugely enthusiastic about the use of virtual consultation and that's reflected I think in their response rate, but physios were, were pretty close behind them. Um, and I will hear later on about, about what speech and language therapists did. Um, we also used, uh, asked them about the platforms that they were using, and that was around the thing that um, Ewan was talking about earlier on. It's a very fragmented picture here in Northern Ireland um, to do with the systems that we utilise. So we wanted to get a feeling for, for what was actually happening on the ground. Um, and you can see there that Microsoft Teams, which is used predominantly, and one of our trusts was, was quite high, and Zoom was quite high, but there were other things being used used as well and um, really because of necessity for patient access and familiarity and things like that too um, and then I was quite surprised actually that at this point in the pandemic 26 percent of people were using virtual consultation for group work um, and I think that's that's really indicative that our services did run a lot of group sessions and they wanted to maintain those so that doing it virtually was a way to continue with that. The top there is just asking about um, people that actually were using virtual consultations, phone and video, there's some figures there, and those who wanted to continue using it or planned or thought that, that would be a good idea. So that's good to see that the numbers were pretty high um, and there were obviously some people that, that weren't so keen. And we also asked them about the training that they received around um, carrying out virtual consultations. And this was an interesting response because 189 people said, no, they didn't receive any. And then 42 people said, no, but my friend did tell me how to do this. Or I did ask the IT team to come and help me with that. Um, and because this was the start of the pandemic, I think there was a lot of that going on. And some people saw that actually as training. Um, so it's just interesting to see that the, the the way people um, interpreted that question around it being the formality of the training. And I love to see that that peer support level was so high um, in the types of training that people were commenting on. And that really just in increases the need for the likes of the Digital Champions programmes and the DIPG that um, Ewan's been talking about there. And then other things that they had used were local guidance, usually on the system from IT teams or online or professional body guidance as well. And um, so that was interesting to see um, people's conception of, of what training entailed. And along that note, I then wanted to maybe go to our next poll. And this is my last one. Um, just to think about your opinions on training and what you um, may have received so far. Do you think it's necessary or do you think it's just using a virtual consultation platform? It's fine. Everyone can do that. Do you need any training on the setup or any specifics around um the differences between virtual and face-to-face -face and how you might need to adapt your practice you can choose as many as you want of those that's interesting I think to me because I think there's an assumption probably that um as your students you're younger and you're more aware of what's of, of the sort of technical setup side of things and obviously that is reflected in some people's responses there but others say that it would be helpful to have that but probably the majority of it is looking at how we need to adapt our clinical practice from a face-to-face -face environment to a virtual one so that's great thanks very much okay so the next two slides are just looking at what staff and um, perceive the benefits to be which is what I've really asked you already and there's a lot of crossover here so and we gave them some options and um, like a reduced number of people not attending reduction in travel time being able to see more patients a day and um, but really the benefits were gained from the bit where they could just put in their thoughts and there was a lot around you know 
it being useful for infection control and to see shielding patients um, that, it, that I haven't written on there because it wasn't going to be relevant long term, but um, those things did come through as well. Um, being able to assess children in their own environment, children came through really strongly um, around the use of virtual consultation and we'll talk about, about that a little bit more. Um, but then flexibility and stuff around accommodation was really key as well we do have issues with accommodation I think in a lot of our hospitals here especially booking venues for group work and being able to do that from your own home and maybe have a bit of work-life balance with that um, was was picked up on as well <laughs> you can tell we also have problems with parking issues because that came up a few times as well and um, patients were less irate by the time they got to their appointment and um, if they didn't have to park a car um, and then this was asking staff benefits for service users, which isn't ideal because really we should be asking service users what they feel their benefits are. And we did do that, but they were much more locally done questionnaires rather than across the region. And um, so the key things that came up here were your, your more obvious convenience and reduced travel costs. Um, and then people being less anxious if they are seen in their own environment rather than in a hospital environment, both for adults, but particularly for children. Um, and then things around that environmental issue uh, would be being able to observe people or children um, in their home setting, for example, feeding times with children or being able to watch them play with their toys. And then another key thing that came out um, was having other family members or carers being able to join appointments without having to travel or if they were in a complete geographical other geographical location and that came up quite strongly as well with um, virtual visiting that has been happening a lot more in hospitals and therapy appointments even as an inpatient or as an outpatient but having a device there to bring a family member along as well and lastly there somebody said that it was great because a patient could attend while they were on holiday I'm not sure how many patients would want to do that but maybe they didn't lose their appointment slot by doing that so that's one one bonus um, and then the barriers uh, for virtual consultation. And I think we need to be cognizant of the fact this happened at the time when there was a really big shift. So there was a lot of virtual fatigue. There was quite a lot of anxiety and extra time created about getting the setup right and making sure that the appointments were booked because it didn't link with our booking systems at the time. Um, and then there's that whole piece around digital exclusion and making sure um, that the patients are supported to be able to access services and not excluded by the fact that it was um it was digital um, and then the other issues that you mentioned as well earlier was not having that hands-on not being able to take objective measurements not being able to correct or really demonstrate exercises to the fullest um, and then around other AHP services they were worried about you know distinguishing speech sounds or hearing and visual impairments and um interpreting services as well we did link those up but they maybe just weren't quite as straightforward or it took a little while to get those things and um, working um quite as well and and that reduction in rapport or picking up non-verbal clues from patients they're really important in our services and we may struggle to get those or maybe we just need to learn how to get them slightly differently um, and as somebody mentioned there that delay can be very very difficult especially if if um, your connections aren't as good so a lot of stuff there that you had mentioned, but it's good to see it coming out in a survey and have and have some data around it. I've just two more survey questions left. And um, this one was what would staff need in order to sustain virtual consultations? And a lot of that was to do with the infrastructure and the equipment because we did that big shift very quickly. But then it's interesting to see stuff about research and you know evidence that this works um, coming in there as well. And I think there definitely is um a lot of scope for the development of that now, especially that more people are doing it. I think we've tried it in the past, um, but as more people are doing it, that's really important. And then lastly, the, a major thing that was coming through was that patients were very happy to do this when they had to, but now it's put, probably seen as a bit of a second rate service and they feel like they're not getting their money's worth if they're not seeing you face to face, not that they're paying anyway. But I think we have a lot of work to do around education of the public and the fact that this um, has a benefit um, and we need to really be highlighting those as well as, you know, potentially needing a blended approach going forward and, and being able to do the thing that's right for, for their condition. And then lastly, just about top tips. A lot of this was very practical. Um, how, how can you get the best out of your session um, and doing it virtually? And 
most people are very straightforward you know accept things that might go wrong have a backup plan make sure you've everything you need around you uh, a quiet environment um, and be confident with the setup as well get experience with it it was interesting when I was pulling this together I'd put it into alphabetical order and I had two comments right next to each other and the first said try it and the second said try to avoid it um, and I just thought that was really classic <laughs> of um people who have different digital confidence and digital experience um, and and I think that's really important um, I'm reading into that and assuming the person that tried to avoid it didn't really try it very much at all themselves and I think things like the DIPG things uh, like digital champions and and really just having a go and building up that confidence are, are the way we need to go to get this embedded into our services. And I just put this in here because, as Ewan mentioned, that shift from all or nothing to do this, we had to do it. It was a necessity, but we probably do need to go now and make sure that what we're doing, we're doing it for the right reasons. Um, health and social care relies on meaningful interactions between people. If we don't get those it just doesn't work. So we need to make sure that the modality that we're using can still maintain that. And it doesn't mean then that we just do what we were doing face to face, but do it virtually. We have to look at our pathways and we have to work out who it's going to work for and where it's going to be the best thing for the patient and for us. And um, so just to kind of put that as a focus at the, the end of that survey piece. And lastly, just looking at some of the areas that have been particularly innovative. Um, this slide just shows within one trust um, all the different services that had talked about innovation um, using virtual consultation. So you can see there across the range of AHP services, and I'll just pick out the physio ones because that's, that's who we are. So we've got paediatric physio, MSK physio, the community stroke team's physio, um, respiratory, pulmonary rehabilitation, hand therapy, prison health was physio, first contact and full services. So you can see the range of services that did that take this on board um, and utilize. It. And then just two examples from those. One was the consultant hand therapy clinics. We are a regional centre in the Southeastern Trust, so people have to travel from all over Northern Ireland to come um, to those appointments. And that was up to five or six hours at a time return journey. And obviously that's taking out time from work. So they had actually been using virtual consultation for a couple of years before the pandemic um, and 30 to 40 percent of their patients were attending virtually anyway um, but the real benefits for her um, or for, for the therapists in this clinic were that they could see patients in their work environment or in their home environment using tools in a milking parlor or professionals being able to hold um, their equipment she could see how that was affecting um, them being able to do their job those things you might have been able to bring into a clinic piece of sports equipment, but you can see over on the right hand side there, there was no way you were going to bring in a combine harvester or a horse <laughs> to show how, uh, how that would work. So being able to assess a patient virtually in those kind of settings really gave a lot of richness to the advice that she was able to provide from a functional point of view. Um, and again, she mentioned the importance of children who are maybe shy or scared coming into a hospital setting and you can't even interact with them to find out what their issues are so being at home can really improve that and then lastly and um, these speech and language therapy um, therapists in in autism services at the very start um, of the pandemic uh, surveyed their parents to see if any of them would be happy to have their children attend zoom therapy sessions and 80 percent of them were but they had a regional digital slt group before covid which meant that they were able to really explore what they could do with virtual consultation and they utilized green screens and boom cards to make their sessions very interactive now that link there I tried an hour before I started um, this session and it didn't work. So I have managed to find a little video in um, somewhere else, which I'm just gonna see if I can share now. Uh, you and I can see you, if you can hear this, will you give me a thumbs up? With the recent COVID-19 pandemic, we could no longer deliver face-to-face -face speech and language therapy sessions. 
The children we support continue to need intervention, but we were faced with a number of challenges and we knew that we had to get creative. With some research and testing, we developed a green screen programme. Green screens are not something we had previously used, but we took the time to learn as much as we could. This enabled us to develop an interactive programme. We have adapted the materials from our clinic to engage the children within our service in the new virtual world via Zoom. We have been able to use the magic of the green screen to help reach our speech and language goals, including speech, language concepts, understanding and social skills. It has been great fun and it has challenged us to think differently and use our imagination. The activities of the green screen can be tailored to each individual child by using their personal interests, whether it's Peppa Pig or dinosaurs. That's another one! Oh my goodness! We got him so many biscuits! It's all your hard work! Let's see. I hope he doesn't get my fingers this time. Sounds hungry! Doesn't he? So you can see there, um, and I think you can see how there would be a lot of crossover. You could do that kind of thing within physiotherapy as well. It's really just making it very interactive for the children. Um, and the boom cards were quite a similar thing, but probably more speech and language. It was just enabling them to have um, uh, ca cards up on the screen that the, the children could move around with their fingers so that they were much more interactive with the session um, rather than just having somebody talking at them or the way we would and the Belfast Trust and um, actually their physio team for learning disabilities I think had a theme of the Olympics um, and week on week they had a different um, sport that they got the children to, to, to partake in and just by having the green screen in the background meant that they could really immerse the children in that put them into a stadium and um, where they were doing their exercises um, and, it, and it just made it a lot more exciting for them and the autism team had a really fabulous outcome of a child who had selective mutism um, and she'd been attending the therapy uh, therapy appointments for about 16 months before the pandemic um, and she hadn't spoken once during the, those 16 months but when they were using the boom cards on the screen the children child couldn't see the clinician anymore and she actually just started to speak it was the first adult that she's spoken to outside of her family for years um, so the parent of that child felt that that session was much more successful than the face-to-face -face one would have been. And that's what I'm talking about. We need to find out where this really works um, and that it's better than face-to-face -face and, and really explore that with the with public awareness. Um, and, and where it's similar to, we might have a pathway of care that we maybe assess somebody face-to-face -face and then we bring them back virtually to assess how things are going. Um, and I think we just need to... to re-look at our services and, and how we can make the, the most benefit uh, of the use of virtual consultation. That's me. Thank you, Pippa. Um, that's fantastic. Um, I can see we've got a question in the uh, Q&A, so do keep them coming. We'll, we'll come to the questions at the end. But Becky, would you like to share your experiences? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I don't have a presentation. I just thought I would talk through my experience on my most recent placement and just really go through what, from a student's perspective, what it feels like. It, for me, I was a bit sceptical. So I'll just give you some background. I am, I'm 30, so I'm a mature student and um, I'm in my second year and I was a lawyer before. So this is a huge learning curve for me physio was a whole new thing <laughs> um but my first placement was um acute medicine but respiratory so I had a very hands-on first placement and I really enjoyed that um and I I'll be completely honest I was a little bit skeptical about virtual placements mainly because I didn't know if I was going to get the practical handling and the the skills that I was going to need to be a, a successful band five and I think that is a really fair um worry for any student really because the whole point of placement is to make sure you're completely ready and you're ready to take on patients really you're about five you're going to be expected to to handle things yourself really um so i was very very skeptical i was very anxious and um my second placement was a virtual one and i didn't have a clue what to expect because i'd never it hadn't even been discussed in lectures that that might be happening um, so my second placement was with FCPs and for people who 
who don't know what that is, that's first contact practitioners. I know that some areas of the country are quite slow in the uptake of that, and that's due to funding and various bits and pieces. So um, where it was mainly primary care based, and I was I was at home for I think three days a week, and then I would be put into either a pain clinic or um, an FCP clinic once a week. And that was dotted around um, Frimley and sort of the commuter belt um, around London. So um, how did I find it? I, I think initially I was quite sceptical, but I kind of went in thinking, actually, I just need to embrace this and see what this is all about. Um, I think virtual consultations are definitely here to stay. And I think as students, we need to just um, get as much experience and actually having a placement in it is going to make you... I think ready to be a BAM5 because I think MSK outpatients in particular are relying heavily on virtual consultations at the moment. Um, how would I compare face to face to virtual? There are things missing. I, I definitely think when you when you have someone in clinic, for example, I'm I would I've been taught that we look how they stand on the chair, how they hold themselves walking into the room, how you're looking at the body language, you're looking at everything about them it's down so that you can pick up on yellow flags as soon as they stand from the chair and and actually by asking them to walk to you that might be the most natural gait analysis you're going to see because you could get really weird gait analysis if you're saying can you walk up and down the room or whatever um that being said a lot of our assessment is subjective assessment anyway which you can do via telehealth or teams or over the telephone so it's not all bad I actually really think there is a place for it um, I think FCP clinics really champion it because there's such a fast turnaround um, and actually quite a lot of patients that come through those types of clinics and MSK outpatients I haven't done an MSK outpatients placement but from what I've been told is you do get quite the similar pathologies coming through so actually you can get your pattern recognition comes from your subjective assessment, so you can do that over telehealth or, um, yeah, or virtual communication. Um, I did that. Being said, as a student, it's a massive learning curve when you're trying to assess a patient because you've been told all these special tests and how you palpate and and everything else. And actually, one thing that my placement was really good for was teaching me how to do that virtually so getting a patient to do a resisted test for you again we're not taught that in lectures because I don't think we've never need I mean we have been recently because they've been online but I think yeah I, I think it's um it's definitely interesting and I do think it's a place from a student's perspective it's going to be really really beneficial because I think it's here to stay um and for the feedback that I have from my educators was actually you're going to be more prepared to be about five if you've done a virtual placement because your consultations your pain clinics your group sessions so for example i had i think three group sessions a week and they were all virtual and i, I from my perspective the patients really engaged I, I don't know i felt particularly the chronic pain group i think they felt safe enough to do that they didn't have to some people are really functioning unable to to sort of commute to the clinic or what have you so actually I think they felt safe enough to to participate um going back to sort of student side of it the mark scheme is very much built around uh, practical placement so there was criteria that I just couldn't satisfy in my mark scheme and I had to feed back to the university and that's something that I think as a, a physiotherapy sort of looking at it more globally, I think there's, it's been such a rush to get everything ready and get everyone out on placement. I think the universities and other infrastructure needs to be put in place and some guidance maybe on what, how we're marked. Um, but I, that being said, I had a really amazing placement. I had some really supportive educators and also the educators are learning too. So it's quite nice because you kind of team up and you're like, oh, I would do that. And then, like, oh, yeah, that's not a bad idea. And actually, I felt like it was more of a, uh, what's the word? It was more of a collaboration as opposed to 
the educator telling me this is how it should be done it was more like how would you do it and it I don't know I found it really helpful anyway um just trying to think what else to say really um some downsides to it because we were primary care we had quite a lot of people moaning about the fact they were having on another virtual consultation <laughs> um but they didn't like that too much um so that was fun um and also i think just maximize your opportunities i think you get quite i think you go into virtual places and think oh god you know i'm not going to get the experience i need but for example i had quite a lot of time to do some research the fact that my research proposal and it's given me a, a global more sort of global view of um really how how important commissioning is and, and how we prove our service as well um virtual consultations are here to stay and i do think they have their place but i also think there's an element of every patient is entirely different and some consultations did just did not go well and but it might be that that would have been the case if they were face to face anyway so the barriers might have been there before and um yeah i don't know it's a bit of, it's a bit of a tricky one i i really think it has its place as a student virtual placement has its place virtual consultations are really important I think we just need to build an infrastructure for students to be prepared going into them, maybe, um, and having a mark scheme so we feel supported. Because I think there were definitely times where I thought, oh God, you know, I'm not going to get the grade I should because I can't satisfy that criteria. Um, yeah, I think that's it from me. I think that's so interesting, Becky, that you were talking about the fact that your educators were learning at the same time. And I hope you can see that from the presentation that I've just given, it is new for everybody. And that's probably been really useful for both of you to learn together um, and to explore that. And, and I think as well, it's it's an area where students can can really help um, potentially with with new things that are happening um, and, and to bring those alongside and don't be afraid to make those suggestions um, because we, we need them. <laughs> Absolutely echo what Pippa just said, you know, in a way I'm a wee bit disappointed that it's taken COVID for us to get to that much more collaborative place between educators and, and, and students. I, I, I think that should be the norm forever now that we've got it. Um, you know, break down some of that hierarchy because, because you you know the, the the students of today, the physios of tomorrow, will be amongst the most resilient physiotherapists that have ever walked this earth. Just to get to the point of graduation, um, you're going to be a much more resilient person th than you would have been having not gone through what you're going through right now. So, so that's a massive thing. Don't underestimate that. It's huge just to survive physiotherapy degrees just now. But think about the additional skills that you've got. I totally hear what you're saying, Becky, about some skills that you're just not able to get in virtual consultations, but there will come times to learn them and you never stop learning. But you're coming in with loads, loads more experience than I did when I started my first band five job. Uh, different ideas, different experience of those virtual consultations. And my request to all of everybody on, on the call tonight would be, get involved in those discussions when you're on placement and keep them going when you get into the workplace as a band five physiotherapist because it's critical that we grab that expertise and the experience out, out of you guys to, to drive these services forward and um, because you've got as much if not more experience than the people who have been there for 30 years delivering physical hands-on face-to-face stuff so so we we'd expect you to be leading the way with this so please do that and you, you said it was maybe a throwaway comment becky grab those opportunities you grab them and run with them because I was really skeptical going into it and actually in the first day I was like no no I'm going to embrace this I'm going to get everything out of it that I can um and I'm a, a therapy assistant as well part-time and the more that I was talking to people in the acute setting and in our patients they were just like it's just here to say it is efficient um and actually we've been plunged into it as qualified and we're learning but actually you're going to be going into band five having that experience um and it also just from a virtual placement perspective you also generally get an overview of commissioning and managerial things that i guess as a band five you might not even have been exposed to or thought of um it just goes to show how important proving our services and things like that so i i really got a lot out of mine um i was very lucky with my educators as well so 
I, I, I don't, champion them. <laughs> those those situations, experiences that weren't all that positive, you know, with the, the patient, was it what you said, was it what the patient did, you know, reflect on those, because it, it was Nicky Lauda, who's a, a former uh, F1 driver, who said that he learned more from his failures than he'd ever done of his successes. So those things that didn't quite happen right, step back from them, reflect, what could I have done differently? What could I have done better? What could the patient have done? You know, what, you know, think about it. it. It more than likely wasn't your fault. It was something else that was going on, but reflect on it because you can, you can deliver a really good service if you can start to, to reduce those negative experiences and, and, and build them into positive structures. So yeah, you, you, learn, you learn every day and you'll continue to do when you qualify to. So I just say, I had a chance to, to read Lydia's one. Everybody can see the questions, can't they? Not not just us or do you need, do you For the recording, them? is it okay to read it out or summarize? Can do. I'll summarize a little bit uh, on Lydia's one. It's the first one in. So uh, Lydia's on a placement in community pulmonary uh, community pulmonary rehab, uh, soft launch new rehab platform, which is in the form of an app which you follow for your home exercise program. Uh, there's a messaging service, and then the the patients are rung once a week as well. Um, Lydia's concern is that patients um, aren't getting the social uh, interaction that for many of the patients is really important. Understand this is coming about due to COVID. As normally we do exercise classes, but I'm worried this isolated way of physio will continue after COVID is settled. What are your thoughts? I've said lots. Nikki or Pippa, do you want to jump in first? Yeah, I am. Um... I think this may be my answer is one bit of this. I absolutely agree that rehab, rehab classes are designed for peer support, aren't they? And, and, and they get so much from that. Um, but I think there are skills within the virtual world that can really help that. Um, and I'm sure you may have done it through university, but even just the likes of breakout groups and putting patients into smaller groups and giving them specific things to talk about and feedback on can really help build relationships that sometimes you don't get if you're in a room full of people. Um, so there can be benefits as well, but that kind of knowledge about how you get collaboration happening or peer support happening virtually is a skill in itself. And I think it's probably something that we need to learn about too. Um, so there's that, but there's also, yeah, going forward, that potential isolation, especially if people are already potentially isolated, can be difficult. Um, but then maybe if you get them to meet up more frequently virtually themselves, um, and they can do that, because if, you, if you're short of breath and you maybe struggle getting out of the house, then they're not going to do that. So again, I'm just going, yes, there's positives, yes, there's negatives. And I think we have to embrace all of those and work out what works for who. Um, but yeah, I, I do share your, your concerns about it. I, I completely understand because it certainly worries that I felt on, I, I was um, observing a pain clinic a couple of times a week. And that was with a psychologist and a, a physiotherapist. And you could just sense the isolation that people were feeling anyway at home because of COVID and everything else, which just has another mental health element altogether. Um, I agree, but I also see the benefit of the virtual classes. Sometimes you get better participation. So I think it's just good. Again, it's patient centered, isn't it? Some people really benefit from that method and others just won't. And I think, yeah, I think it is here to stay. And I do. I also think maybe sometimes rehab, rehab apps have been shown to really um, improve adherence to what we're trying to do. So in terms of community pulmonary rehab, I can see it from both sides of the coin again, but I think it's here to stay and actually it could be really beneficial and we could get healthier populations as a result. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with that. I, I think that the way that we, we used to provide pulmonary rehab isn't going to work in, in, in a virtual setting. So what um, Pippo said, if, if you just put your face-to-face -face classes on a screen, that's not going to do the job for you. What you need to do is digitise the pathways and rethink how you're offering those classes. So for, for those patients who are you know, socially isolated because of COVID, on top of potentially already challenges that, they, that they've got, those rehabilitation classes might be the only window to the rest of the world that those people have that week. Do you know? So actually you could use those in, like people are saying, breakout rooms. And, you know, we've all done a Zoom quiz. Do you know the 
any kind of things to try and get people engaging with each other can help just to, to, to get patients on board. And then it doesn't feel as scary if they're a wee bit more digitally confident to be able to do a class online. I always use my Auntie Betty as an example here. She, she's aware of it, so I'm allowed to share. She's 92, she's got Parkinson's and COPD. She lives alone, she's got no carers. She had an iPad that sat in a box for three years until COVID hit. And now it's the, her, you know, she has just stopped um, isolating now. So the iPad became her window to the rest of the world. So she spoke to her Parkinson's nurse via the iPad. She attended her pulmonary rehab classes online and loved it because it gave her something to do. Um, she also was able to FaceTime my kids. So 90 years between, you know, my, my great aunt Betty and, and, and my two kids. And they were talking about Peppa Pig and all these kind of things on FaceTime. But it was just, it, it stopped my auntie Betty becoming isolated. So that there, if we use it right, it can work brilliantly. And it's just about finding the ways just to fine tune it and to get it working right. Yeah, and I think that probably goes on to answer that next question about noticing a difference between different generations of patients. I don't have a lot of personal experience, but what I've heard coming through is more about the digital confidence. And that can be brilliant in an older person and not so good in a younger one. Um, and I find it in our service, it's just hard to know unless you specifically ask somebody how confident they are and they can surprise you <laughs> as to how much they are. So what we've started doing now is um, just putting up posters. We're, we're starting to use a patient portal um, and it's very time consuming to ask patients, do they have an email address? Do they want to be part of it? But if you've got information up about it, the ones that are keen will ask. Um, and, and that can be a really helpful way of finding out who, who the ones that are it's going to work for if they come to you. And I hope as, as time goes on and the public get more familiar with that, it will be just another way of interacting with healthcare services. It will be more the normal. Absolutely. And on that, never, like Papa said, never ever assume about anything. Just because you're young, old, or somewhere in the middle of the road doesn't necessarily equal digital con uh, confidence or digital uh, ability. So my Auntie Betty is 92. She's pretty good on an iPad now. It wasn't a couple of years ago. My dad is 30 years younger and he's useless on any sort of technology. So never expect, never assume digital ability and that counts for within the profession as well so some people would assume that the young students of today are much more digitally literate than than you know i was when i was a student that might not be the case so never make assumptions the other thing around about patients as well is around about ability or disability so you might assume that because a patient is disabled that they have less digital literacy than, than than, than somebody who, who is able-bodied. And again, that might not be the case. That disabled person might rely on technology and have done for a number of years to, to, to live their life. So they might be an absolute technology expert. So never ever make assumptions. Assumptions are dangerous around a bit digital. So ask the question. And if they say, yeah, I've got it, I'm on, on top of it, fine, let's go. But if not, let's find a space to allow them to, to do it. It's a massive part of inclusion rather than exclusion with digital. Um, just going back to that last question as well, I, I, I did notice actually with some even some patient groups, um, sometimes virtual consultations are difficult um, to the point where even the family are talking for the patient. So it's that side of it becomes, and, and I, I can even see the patient sometimes, you know, they were on the other side of the room because of their anxiety levels and things like that. And actually that I found that quite difficult is having that sort of discussion to be like actually I really really love hearing what you have to say and how you feel but I need to see them as well and it was that side of it could be even trickier again it's and this person was young so I made the assumption that he would be absolutely fine and would happily talk to me but actually wasn't the case and that's a reflection on me um think about how, how strong your communication skills are to find your way around that, me that member of the patient's family to get to them. And again, it's just a different, it's tweaking the, tool, the tools in the toolkit that, that are going to make you an even better physiotherapist, Becky. So, you know, reflect on that situation. How would I do it differently next time if you would do it differently? But think how much you've learned from that. You know, it's, it's a massive learning curve. Uh, it's, it's proper deep end learning. 
And if we can just stop the lead weights attached to the feet, then, we'll, then we're doing pretty well. Um, is there training available from the CSP about how to do classes, group sessions, virtual consultations, or is there another provider that that provides that training? Um, I mean, maybe Becky, what what helped you prepare, and what what would help you prepare before we go to what's available at the moment and what's coming up? I don't know if it's common knowledge, but at the moment, NHS England have a series of training hubs dotted around the country um, and you can they have loads of CPD and videos and um, sort of free CPD events which look at virtual consultations and how to manage them. Um, I use a couple of those. Um, I actually think maybe peer to peer at the moment might be a really good way of doing it. So if there's anyone on your course that has already done one they can sort of give you feedback on how they dealt with it but I don't think there's anything formally out there yet for students um in terms of classes and group sessions and virtual consultations I'm sure each trust will have their own format and hopefully we'll have some training but unfortunately I I don't actually know <laughs> if there's anything out there at the moment that is sort of global I think it's very much sort of local um, but I really recommend if you can get onto any NHS England training hubs. They, they focus around um, nurses and GPs, but actually they're reaching out to AHPs now and really want students to get on board. So I really recommend that side of it. I'll jump in and say there's a, a couple of bits that we've got in the CSP website. Uh, to complement what exists elsewhere so there's a, a link in the in the chat there for everyone to see that is the remote service delivery option so that's our hints and tips around about how to run it's much more on, on an individual basis rather than on groups uh, put our hands up to that um but there's there, there's some some research there that we've got and we've tried to bring in different bits and pieces from elsewhere as well so some of the nhse stuff that becky spoke about um is, is in that as well um and um, there is also the digital physio pages, so that's another link uh, I put in earlier on in the chat, uh, and there's stuff there about explaining what is some of the terminology that we're talking about, so what is uh, a virtual consultation, what is tele-rehab, what is tele-care, what is an electronic patient record, all those kind of things, so again, have a little bit of a look at them, there's some, some resources and some further reading on that. And a shameless plug again for join the DIPG. The peer support is vital. So join it and reach out to those folks that are experiencing it at the same time. And then the final thing is about another shameless plug for Physio uh, UK this year. Uh, digital transformation is one of the key themes. Um, and we have four um, focus symposia uh, are in, under the digital transformation theme. And three of those are about uh, virtual consultations. One led by our very own Pippa McCabe. Um, and I'll think about how we use it and what settings we use it, the evidence behind it, some learning from those who are a wee bit further ahead in terms of delivery. So there, there's loads to learn from, from that. So get along to Physio UK and I'm sure that Steph and Izzy will be in touch very soon about opportunities for students to get involved in the delivery of that virtual conference as well. So watch this space. Part of my... Um remit at the start of, of doing all of this was to put together a, a sort of guidance document um, and I searched high and low and everything that's been mentioned is all that I found um, so yeah I'm not aware either of anything specific and it is all kind of experience led I think at the moment hopefully somebody will be really experienced and then we'll make a fortune by running training sessions. <laughs> opportunity for the students to you know for yeah. you folks to get involved and create the evidence base that we need to do that so where there's a gap in evidence fill it find some stuff do mm. your research project about it do it as a, as a placement project you know get in and fill that gap we need to know that information why can't it be you that sets sets the, the, the bar high for everybody else I want to take this opportunity to thank our panel, to Pepper, to Ewan and to Becky. Um, it's been really fantastic to be able to um, hear from all of you. Um, I think the, the future is really exciting. And thank you again to our panel. And I hope you all have a lovely evening. Thanks, guys. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks for having us.